how reliable is human intuition? Those are two, two parts. That's the first part. Second part, how can that be programmed? Um, so the first part is how reliable is, is human intuition? Um, and the answer is we don't know. But um, what you, what you, the situation that you really want to be in is uh, human intuition comes up with a question to ask, and then you use data to actually back it up, right? Mm -hmm. And, that, and that, those are the systems that we're building. We say, I think this is, this, you know, I think this is fraud. Let's go explore. This looks like fraud to me. You go into the details and you figure it out. Um, how can I be programmed is an interesting question, and it sort of goes to, sort of to the, the larger vision of what we've imagined, um, which is you saw like um, how it's keeping an associative trail of, of everything that I've done in the application. So we're actually building up a robust data set, not, not us, but each instance is building up a robust data set of what the users are doing. And you can imagine that if you can come up with the right machine learning, you can figure out how to automate some of the, you can say like, these are the good analysts and these are the bad analysts. What do the good analysts do? What do the bad analysts do? Sure. And you could actually build some automated models out of that. That's kind of a little further out from where we are right now, but we're building up all the infrastructure you need to do that. So this is an interesting question. It's a long one. Unless you argue that it is theoretically impossible to build a human brain, it must be possible to build some sort of an AI, AI mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, even if it is biologically based, even if it takes a thousand years. Do you agree? Absolutely. No, uh, look, my, my point was not that AI is going to fail. Uh, my point was, uh, uh, like, I got a great piece of advice when I, when I, when I was 18 and had my heart broken for the first, the, the first time, which was someone said, you know what, eventually it's going to be okay. And I said, you know what, I already believe that. What do I do between now and then, right? Um, and that's the, that's the real tough question. So it's like, will AI come? I personally believe, yes, it will. Uh, what do we do between now and then, right? And the answer is we can't all just kind of hold our breath and be like, so is AI done yet, right? And so if we're going to actually build systems that sort of make the world a better place, solve our problems, or maybe you know, sell ads, whatever it is that you're into, yeah. um, then you know, we, we, gotta, we gotta do something now, and we gotta do it without AI. So uh, you know, this is one approach. Do you, how do you see the technological singularity playing into the man-computer symbiosis? Well, I mean, if we hit the singularity, the, you know, this will all be kind of irrelevant. But the real question is, when does this? <laughs> I mean, this kind of goes back to the, the last question: is like, you know, we're, we're in that time, like as 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 looks like we're talking about between, you know, now and then. Um, and you know, I for one, you know, welcome our AI overlords, but mm -hmm. uh, in case they ever see a recording of this talk, but. Uh, but in, until then, you know, you know, I, we got to do something uh, because we because we don't really know. Like, you know, there are predictions that say, you know, hey, the singularity was going to happen yesterday, but it hasn't. Uh, but maybe it'll happen five years from now. Maybe it'll ten years. Maybe it's a hundred years out. So, you know, until like, I, I I believe in the forward march of progress, but I also believe in sort of living in the now and and, and figuring out you know what we can do today. Um, and that and moving towards singularity is not actually a problem that I happen to be working on. Sure. By the way, we are recording that. Next question is going to be political. Oh, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you think that Mitt Romney is, a, is proof that a computer can implement fuzzy logic, but loses the ability to do so basic arithmetic? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I'll, I'll leave that one alone. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Well, what, what I'll say is, I, I mean, if you've been paying attention, it's not, I mean, it, the logic circuits seem to be a little damaged because the you keep getting different answers back mm -hmm. every time you run the same question. So, um, without taking a particular political position, but yeah. Um, can you think of any inflection point as you, your organization grow that helped you scale and remain nimble and succeed going, you know, from 50 to 700 people? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, um, there's been a few. I mean, all, most of the inflection points actually go the other way, which is the bigger you get, certain things get harder, I think. Um, but I think we're, we're, we've hit an inflection point recently where we've done enough good work out in the world. Like, you know, when I joined the company, it was like, we've got this crazy idea. Come jump off a cliff with us. We have no idea if this is going to work. And you kind of had a really trust in the people that you were dealing with to be like, all right, well, we'll see how this works out. Um, and, you know, by the time we hit probably about 2008, 2009, we had enough sort of wins under our belt, enough reputation that we could point to of things that we're, we, had, we had actually built and that were working, where it's, a, it's sort of much easier for people to say, yeah, you know, there's no reason for this to fail. Uh, you know, it's, it's really not a question of, like, will this work or won't it work, but just how successful will it be? And once you've reached that point, you've kind of mitigated a lot of risk, and it's much easier for people to say, I'd like to come and, you know, take a bet with you, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, bet on the same things that you're betting on. Um, the other, that's a big one, I guess. Um, 
you know, given the work that I do now, which is offsetting the, the issues around growth, I mostly just see the negative aspects of growth. Sure. Um, and it, it's actually hard to remain nimble, but there are things that you can do to sort of keep that happening. Okay. So this one is about uh, arguing about artificial intelligence investment is paying off now. So mm -hmm. let me ask the question. Did all the money in the golden age of AI results in, this, in those payable, paying off today? Oh, absolutely. The example is, you know, Pathfinding, navigation. Oh, maybe, absolutely. Yeah. Look, to be to, to to be really clear, like it's not that I'm like completely hating on AI. I'm just making fun of them a little bit for not succeeding, right? Um, and, and, and if there's any criticism I can make, it's that it's that 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 pursuit of the of the holy grail um, sort of eclipsed looking into alternative methods of building systems. So they said, well, you know, I don't want to build thinking machines. I want to figure out how man and computer can work together very well. And they said, well. Why don't you want to build thinking machines? What's wrong with you? Wouldn't that be awesome, right? And that's sort of the way that, that research has, sort of, has gone in the, in the past, like, you know, five or six decades. Um, and so, uh, but there's been incredible amounts of amazing technology that have come out of AI research. And, you know, what we do today with things like data mining and statistical methods and all the stuff that comes out of machine learning is, like, it's incredibly useful. Sure. Um, you know, we use it in some of our technology. Like, it's not, it's not, it's not an, an either or. It's just a, it's like there, there is a deeply qualitative difference between having really good statistical methods and having machines that think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in, in another question, so I'm not sure what does this uh, really mean, let me ask anyway. Why were credit card companies able to do fraud detection when PayPal could not? Oh, yeah. Okay. So this one's, uh, this one's pretty easy, actually. Um, and it really has to do with the way that credit card companies structure the world, right? So if you're a credit card company, the way that you structure the world is that everything is not your problem, yeah. right? So if you're a PayPal, <laughs> You're a merchant, right? You're, you're, you're processing credit card transactions. And the credit card company has 180 days to tell you, hey, that was fraud. It's your problem. Um, and the other thing that credit card companies have is they have a very long, like, they won't give you a credit account without doing a credit check. They actually, they, they start, they give you a small credit line, they ramp it up so they, they sort of hold their risk small. And then over time, they're actually building up information about what you do. And so they can actually use data mining and automation to figure out when, you're, when an anomalous transaction is being made uh, on your account, and all, many of us have probably gotten that, you know, like you go to Europe and they're like, whoa, your credit card shut down. <laughs> like, it's me, I'm in Europe. Um, but, but PayPal in particular was, was in the situation where because of what they were offering as sort of like this internet payment service, people wanted to sign up and use it right away. And um, the fraudsters figured this out and they were like, well, we'll just sign up a new account, we'll do a bunch of fraud, and they won't find out for like six months or six weeks or whatever it is until it's reported, and then it's PayPal's problem, which is why PayPal was paying all this money uh, to, to deal with the fraud stuff. And so they were, they were sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place in that regard, where the credit card companies were just like, yeah, this is not our problem, it's your problem. Sure. All right, so we have quite a few questions. Thank you for all the questions. You know, Ahmed already told me this is going to be the last question I picked up in a random order, the last questions that we are going to address today. Okay. There. Um, what happens when we have a model of emotions and human social behaviors well how do you how do you handle that yeah what what uh, sure what happens when we have a model of emotion and human social behaviors how do you factor that into that well I mean the thing about models um, is that that they're always this approximation um, and the only reason we keep models around is if they're useful, right? So if, they're, if, they're, if they give us useful predictions about the future. So if, if you had a good, solid model of human emotion uh, and social behavior, you could use it to figure out all kinds of stuff. Uh, the question's a little vague. Can, can we actually throw that one out and have a different last question? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not quite sure exactly what's being asked there. I was like, well, that would be really cool. We could use that for all kinds of stuff, right? Um, there's not really, you know, it's like, well, what if we had flying cars? Um, you want to talk about self-driving cars? What's that? Self-driving cars. That yeah. was the next question. Oh, sure. That was. <laughs> <laughs> um, CSI, mm -hmm. enhance, zoom, enhance, reflect, enhance. Yeah. Yeah, that's all total bullshit. Like, you can't, <laughs> you, you can't, you can't do anything like that. No. Um, but I mean, to, to maybe take that somewhere interesting is, is like, you know, our, our view on a lot of this stuff is not that you need sort of magic boxes that can do things that, that no one else can do. Um, it's really just about lining up the data that you already have in such a way that you can access it very quickly. So, you know, what we've seen with a lot of workflows, law enforcement or otherwise, is that things that used to take two weeks now take five minutes. Yeah. 
right? And that is a, is a deep, deep qualitative change, which, which like puts a bunch of options on the table to figure things out that you, you didn't have before. But yeah, we, you can't like interpolate data that isn't there, you know? In the, anytime you have an enhance button, that's just, you know, that's like, I like to say that like we're making the software like you see in the movies, uh, but not that software, right? It's, it's the software where it's just like bring up his dossier, like, oh yeah, we have that, you know? Like if you have the data, you can bring it up and sort of move through it very rapidly, but you can't like make up data where you don't have it. Like there, that doesn't work. Absolutely. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank right. you very much, Ari. Appreciate that.